so like I just said, this is a buffet. It, you're not going to take everything. And I, Ron said it very well in terms of you're going to adjust according to your needs and program. And there are times where you're going to add things or subtract things, so on and so forth. And you, you, can't, you can't do it all, all the time. And then uh, uh, the third thing I, I just want to say is uh, on game day, you, you have to find, you, you got, and even in practice, you've got you to catch your guys doing things right. You know, I think so often, we, you know, we, we, and scouts are notorious, he can't do this, he can't do that. Well, hey, I want, you're out there to find out what they can do. I want, I want to know what he can do. And I think that we need to put our players in a position where we can catch them doing things right and give them a chance to have success because, I mean, a prime example here is this young man, this, uh, Mr. Garrett back there, you know, he works his rear end off. You know why? He's had success and he's good at it. And you see it in little kids, but it, the same thing is going on with our players. And, and when they have success, so we need to put them in a situation, especially on game day, where they can have, have success. You know, asking a guy to throw a 3-2 breaking ball because it's the right pitch to throw here when he's got no chance to have success probably is, is not the right thing to do. Or, you know, the, that 70% fastball mix or so on and so forth because when they have success, man, the next day they're ready to get after it. When they get beat up too often, and we beat them down, and, the, and then their motivation and their self-image and a lot of things suffer. So sometimes you have to stall that development process just to build up their psyche. Uh, and I'm sure you're all aware of that. Uh, just put something very quickly up on the board that, we're, that we do. Uh, we, we give them a percentage grade based on what percentage of these things that, happened during a ball game. Uh, and some of these are, are lofty goals, and, and, and I think they are realistic. However, not for everyone on your staff. 65% strikes, uh, minimum 60% strikes with each pitch. If they get 65% strikes, but they only throw 50% change-up strikes, uh, I, I don't give them a plus there. Zero base on ball scoring or lead to scoring. Uh, 80% two out put aways, and, uh, and we're talking about when we get two outs, we're going to get that guy out. You know, if I don't get him out, that's, that's a minus. Uh, zero defensive breakdowns, PFPs, bunch picks, backups, cover home first, so on, so out, so on. Uh, that should be 80% two strike put, uh, uh, put aways. Zero two out runs. 75% first outs in an inning, 75% 1-1, 2-0, strikes, and 100% of 1-1 pitches uh, for strikes, zero free base runners, three bases, wild pitch, stolen base, and box, zero three-run innings, and zero 20-plus pitch innings. So that's something that, that goal-wise we're trying to accomplish. I uh, want to talk about controlling the running game and, and moves and just some techniques and then I'll do a little PFP stuff and uh, Strami, I don't want to step on your stuff, so... I got nothing else oh. to talk about. Okay. Well, that's how I felt the first day. I felt like I was, I was the last guy in a roast and they told all my jokes. Uh, you want to control the running game at first base. You know, I, I think that with the mechanical stuff that we've all talked about here in terms of explosive and quickness, I think you're well on the way because that's going to produce a break time that is, is going to give your catcher a chance to throw people out or is, gonna, is going to stop people from running in, until they really have no choice but to run. And when you buy pitches by being quick to the plate, some of those pitches turn into double plays. And so before they even get a chance to run. That's why, you know, uh, as a catching coach, you know, I talk to our catchers, hey, you may not be able to throw them out, but if you make the play close, the next time before they run, they're going to think, man, i got to have a great jump. I had a good jump last time, and he almost, he almost threw me out. And so if I make the play close, maybe I buy a pitch or two. In the interim, while I'm buying those pitches, 
Something good's going to happen. We're going to get a ground ball double play or line drive at someone, turn a double play. Something good's going to happen. So I, I forestall the running game a little bit by being quick to the plate as opposed to being a 1-5-1-6 one, one, guy where, hey, we're going to take a pitch here and we're going to run right now. So the benefit of being explosive and being quick to the plate not only has arm benefits, but it also helps you control the running game. And our goal is to be in the, for our right-handers, to be in the 1-2 range on the fastball, low 1-2s and low 1-3s on, on our breaking ball. One of the things that you can do to supplement that efficiency to the plate is hold the ball. Hold the ball. If you hold, pit, uh, base runners don't like when you hold the ball. When I'm talking hold the ball, it's a three count. One, two, three, pitch. Because the longer you hold the ball, the more tension you create in that base runner. They, they like a nice rhythm. Now, you have to change the rhythm sometimes, certainly. One thing that's happened in college baseball, I don't know about in, uh, in, in uh, high school baseball, but now we used to quick set. Now they're making you really hold the ball and stop and, and almost to the point where you can't stop and go. It's got to be a real full and complete stop. And so we've gone to, we had 23 box called in, in the first uh, probably 26 games. So we've gone to all long hold, but the long hold will really discourage that guy. Or if he does run, he's going to run with not with his best jump. Uh, one thing that <coughs> we, our philosophy on pick at first base is every time we throw over there, we're trying to get that guy out. You know, I don't believe in this bad, better, best. I, I want to make a few, as few picks to first base as I can. I want that guy focused on the hitter. We're, we're all about getting this guy out. And when you spend too much time on this guy, we, we, we divide this guy in terms of making a quality pitch. So that long hold allows him to create tension over here. Now, long hold, quick pick, we're trying to pick this guy off. So the ball's got to be down. And our thing is it's got to be short. The ball's got to come up out of the glove, short jump pivot. I know Brent has a little bit different take, and I was just watched him the other day going back on his heels, which I thought was quite interesting. My emphasis is on is like you're standing in a trash can, and you've got a real narrow base. Keep that narrow base quick and deliver that ball. Max it out. Let that thing go, and down in that tag zone. But with a long hold, where I create a little bit of tension with that guy, where uh, uh, you know he doesn't react as quickly. Sometimes, if I make a, if I'm on the right hand side of the rubber, this is where I'm, I might make it, and I have a quick long hold, quick pick, and I'm just miss him. I might set up 18 inches closer by backing off just uh, on occasion. Little adjustment uh, to shorten the distance. Okay, that's that's number one. Number two, on the way up or on the way down. You know, a lot of guys they don't get their leads early. For me, you should have that primary lead as soon as you find where the ball is and that guy's on the rubber. You should be into your primary lead. Okay, some guys. One, get their leads late, or they try and get a late walking lead on you. Okay, in that case, you know, we pick on the way up or on the way down. Boom, quick pick, ball up out of the glove. But it's quick. I'm airing it out. As, as good as I can, I'm trying to pick that guy off. Uh, I'm not going to talk specifically about box moves, specifics, but I, I feel like, you know, if you have one, you should, you should use it. Uh, left-handed, that's politically correct, right? Uh, left-handed step-off move, some, some people feel like this is too hard on guys' arms. I don't believe that. I like that little step-off move because now you, you catch that guy in a crossover, you catch that guy leaning, or you catch that guy looking in for, for signals, that uh, that's, that's an effective move. Also, it stops those guys from first move first move break. Now, left-handers, uh, our left-handed move is just the same as our right-handed move. We're into a quick knee to knee. So we don't read. We don't come up here and pause. There, there's no, well, I'm either picking or I'm pitching. I know what I'm going to do. And when that's the case, I think this guy is going to be more efficient to the plate. So now I feel if that guy gets a jump on me, I'm going to get the ball quickly enough to the plate with that knee to knee action that we've got a real good chance of of throwing them out, or I'm going to have a, you know, a quick knee to knee move to first base, or I'm going to have a, a for our lefties, you know, our our 
up or down move is there and without stopping, stepping right through, and and uh, that's an, that's an effective move also. But our guys are not going to have great moves to first base. I'm not too concerned about that. You know, our job is to keep them from getting there, and the best way or having to back up third base or home plate and making quality pitches here. And I think that you know I. You know, for me, what we do is we always sit up with our left-handers looking at that guy. Boom. I look home, pick. I look home, and I pitch. I'm not divided here. I'm, you know, everything's going to the plate. I've predetermined what I'm, what I'm going to do. And again, minimum number of picks. Uh, first baseman behind, I'm not going to go over that one. Uh, but I am going to go over one other. I'm looking in for looking in for a signal. I like to have the ball in the pitcher's hand out of the stretch. Most people do not like that because they feel like young pitchers give pitches away. But I like it because, you know, something happens, now I'm in a position to deliver the ball rather than having to go in and maybe drop the ball or fumble the ball. But more often than not, from this position here, where a lot of base runners are not focused on the pitcher or for the guy that is looking in for the pitch from the catcher or the guy that's trying to gain momentum or get into his primary lead while that guy's looking for signals. Boom, I've got that one with just a little catcher's flick so that, and we've picked quite a few guys off with this one, but again, we're letting it, but you can't do it unless you have the ball, you, unless you have the ball in there. For our left-handers, it's a quick step or they, I let them step off to make that move also. Um, long hold, step off, Okay, and we, we use this for, you know, see if we can get some reaction out of that guy at first base. A lot of times in a bunt situation, long, we want that quick step off, very quick down out of the glove. For me, if you ever see Matt Hurgis do it, he's the guy I like. He's my poster child for the long hold step off. Long hold, boom. And I want to step off before the umpire calls time. I'm trying to get a reaction out of the guy at first uh, to see if maybe I'm going to pitch out or modified pitch out or pick over or, or Something like that. Then the next one is long, long hold, and we, this is a little bit different. And I don't think this would play very well in professional baseball. But you know, usually this long hold, long hold, and then the hitter steps out, or the the, the umpire calls time, and usually use that to see if maybe he's going to show bun in a bun situation, or maybe we get some reaction out of the base runner. What we do is we go long hold, and we pitch. Just when the hitters, you know, they invariably do this. They take their hand off the bat. So just when that hand is starting off the bat, I throw a box fastball right in there. And, and you know, for me, well, you know, I, I, I was just getting ready to pitch, man. Or they'll do this. A lot of hitters, they'll, they'll call timeout and they turn their head. Now, more often than not, the umpire call time. But a lot of times with two strikes, we'll go long hold, pitch on time, and that guy, and you sense it, you know, and we practice it, where that hitter just starts, you can see him just pop, and he's not ready to hit. We just throw a, a four-seam fastball right by him. Oh, I, I, I don't want to get any nasty mail from... Okay. Uh, I'm not going to go into a 52 or 53 pick, but I will go into technique for a pick at second base. Uh, our technique for number one for me with a runner on second just a couple things I always come set looking at home plate because looks uh, are important for us the second thing when I look to second base I don't make a full head turn I just make a quarter turn the reason being the majority of our guys are look home throw home guys when you make a full turn here like this and you come back here now this guy's got a short lead here as I start to come back here to pitch, now he's got too much time to get into a secondary lead and maybe steal a base, okay? Or just get into a secondary lead. When I go here to here, I've cut down the secondary lead automatically with my head turn. And maybe that doesn't make a difference. I, I know it makes a difference stealing third base, but it makes a difference when the ball's hit at the left fielder line drive or a ground ball that's hit a little bit to your shortstop's left and he, you know, guy doesn't have as good a jump, he's not in the throwing lane. Okay, so I, I think that it has some application for you. But also, 
couple with this with a runner on second, you've got that. I don't, I don't believe in, well, I've got one move for a running situation, and then with a runner on second, I've got a different move. For me, I'm into my knee to knee because, number one, that's what I need to deliver my arm with, with uh, explosiveness. But also, when I'm quicker to the plate with a runner on second, what have I done? I mean, that ball's in the contact zone, and he doesn't have as big a secondary lead, so I throw him out by a step, maybe. Or I may throw him out at third base. Okay, so I, I think that you, you basically have two deliveries. You've got a wind-up delivery, and you've got a stretch delivery. I think that quarter turn is, is an important thing. Okay, um, here, our, our move to second base is a jump pivot move. It's the same as at first base. It's just 90 more degrees. So it's a 180. I'm not stepping back and turning. When I step back, I'm in, in the same relative position. It's quick, short, and accelerated to second. Anytime I'm throwing to a base, if I'm picking at first base with the first baseman behind, or I'm throwing to second base with the shortstop and second baseman on the move, or third base with the third baseman on the move, I need to elevate the ball. When I'm picking at first with a guy holding him on and not moving, now the ball's down. But I want to elevate it. You throw that ball down into that tag zone with guys on the move, uh, bad things happen. So elevate for me is mid-thigh to mid-chest. Rather have it a little bit too elevated than, than down in the dirt because sometimes that ball, well, a lot of times that ball goes into center field. And sometimes that guy scores, especially if you're playing your center fielder opposite. You've got a left-handed pull hit or something like that. So that can be a dangerous situation. So we want that, that pick elevated. No look pick at second base. We like this pick because a lot of times that base runner is waiting for you to look and a rhythm thing, especially a guy just steals second base, guys hit a double. First time a guy gets on second base, you know, like that. No look, boom. When those hands start down, our guy's going and we're picking and again, elevating that throw. I think that's a, I think that's a pretty, good, pretty good technique. Uh, next one, uh, inside move. For me, uh, we use the inside move in a bunt situation with runners on first and second so we can try and get a reaction out of the, out of the hitter. We also use it when we've got an aggressive base runner out there who's one of these guys who's kind of, kind of looking and creeping off and we'll just open up the middle of the infield. We'll play that shortstop as far away from second base as we can, the second baseman way over, where this guy feels like, man, they're not holding me on. Then we go ahead and we inside move with no intent to pick at second. For me, when you inside move, your eyes go to the base runner. And so that base runner, a lot of times, he gets out there in uncharted territory on that inside move, especially when you open things up. And he feels like he can't get back, but the reality is that he's closer to second base than the second base from a shortstop. I don't break the second base from a shortstop until after that guy makes that turn and so now, boom, I'm on that guy. More often than not, you'll have a rundown situation you know, for that aggressive base runner. Okay? And when those guys have movement at second base and I'm on the mound, I just stand there. I let them move as much as they want. But I don't pitch to the plate when they've got movement going towards third base. I'm here. Go ahead. Move as much as you want. Move as much as you want to move. Pretty soon that hitter, he gets irritated. He calls timeout. The umpire is irritated. So I, you know, he's taken away from that hitter's focus. But eventually, I'll let him move, 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 get as far as you want. And then he gets past the point of no return, I can inside. But a lot of guys, they see movement at second base, and then they step off right away. Hey, hold the ball. You're not going to pitch the ball. You don't have to work. Just hold the ball. Let's see how far he can go. Let's see how far he goes. Maybe he'll hang himself. Uh, uh, Daylight, you know, shortstop, second baseman, daylight. One, one, of, our, one of our rules with daylight uh, uh, concern, we don't, daylight, uh, we don't daylight with two outs. Because I want that pitcher focused on the, on, the, on the hitter. Now, we can pick with two outs, but it'll be a predetermined pick where I know that I'm going to pick or I'm going to pitch. You know, there's a pick on it with a second base for shortstop. But I don't like daylight with two outs because, hey, if he steals third base, he steals third base. But I gotta get this guy, if I get this guy out, so I don't wanna be in here, is he gonna give me daylight, is he gonna break? And, no, it, and now I'm divided and I can't execute the pitch. So our rule with two outs, no daylight, and with certain pitchers, no daylight, no daylight. Uh, 
on our daylight, you know, they flash open glove or open hand. We jump pivot, but we have a lot of guys that, uh, and Mike Marshall had this move, you know, inside, boom, right there. And it's kind of like a lot of the throwing that you're doing with the weighted balls, you know, with that rotation. Our guys are strong enough to, boom. And if our shortstop with our better guys, if the shortstop or second baseman beats the guy to second, he's out. Because they, they let it fly. You know, with, and I don't, I have no problem with this move right there. And, but you got to be strong to do it. And if you're on this program, you'll be strong enough to do it. Uh, one thing that we've done, and I'm just kind of throwing stuff out, and this is part of that buffet thing. You know, I think everybody's got this one. You know, that long, boom, fake to third, pick to first. And, you know, a lot of times we'll do it, you know, with a, Sometimes we just do it so we can get our guy loose in the bullpen, you know. But a lot of times we'll do it just to see what kind of reaction we get out of the guy with the bases loaded. We may go here, boom, and come back and maybe do it again. And then we watch the guy at second base, and all of a sudden he gives him, you know, one of those. And the next thing you know, it's fake third, pick second with the second baseman. And you'd be surprised how many times you can get that guy at second base. Now this is all... This is all sizzle stuff. You know, it's more important to do a lot of other things well than some of these things. But you get bored in practice someday. You know, you could flip some of this stuff in. But we've had success. Uh, third base pick. We like to pick at third base. You know, basically our third baseman works off of our works off of our leg left of our our pitcher. And left-handers, we just kind of roll through. So when they bottom out, that's when the guy breaks. That ball's got to be elevated and it's got to be thrown. Um, on the long third to first, we run two third to first moves. But the best guy uh, is uh, Mike Fetters. And he does it. You know, most guys you see in the big leagues, they go, it's kind of a token thing. Jesus, do I have to do it? All right, I'll do it. They go, well, okay, now I can pitch. But Fetters, and... He's long arm and long leg, and he really takes a long stride. It's, and another thing that's important, your head's got to be on home plate. You can't give it one of these, because that guy at first base will read it. Head to the plate, long arm, long stride, boom, then I'm right back up, and now I'm reading that runner. Okay? Because if the runner's in that first third of the baseline, standing still, I'm probably going to go to first base. Or if he's going back, I'm definitely going to go to first. If he's in that first third going towards second base, now I've got to redirect a little bit and give it to the second baseman. If he's in the second third and he's closing on that second baseman, I've got to give it to the shortstop. So long, long third to first. And then we also, and this one, to me, is blatantly a balk and should be totally illegal, but there's nothing wrong with me doing this. That's not a balk. I've gained ground to third base. Boom, there, right back to first. And you'll pick a lot of guys with that quick one, a lot of guys off that are not running at first base. But for me, the value of the first to third, the third to first move is what? To cut that, to stop that guy from getting a good jump at first base on a steal. Because he's got to make sure that it's not a third to first. So now he can't, when you clear, he can't break. He's got to delay and make sure you're not going to third base. So we slow his breakdown. That's the, we're not trying to pick him. That's the main, main thing. Now, some teams on the West Coast are pretty smart. What they've done is they get into a two-strike, two-out situation with runners on first and third, and they set up this, they, and they're playing against a team that third to first, and then they break that guy at first base. You pick there, but while, as soon as you turn, that guy from third base is breaking, so we've gone to a, against certain guys, third to first, and then back to third base to stop that. You'll, you're not going to do that, I hope. Then uh, um, right-hander, you know, and left-handers, that step-off move to first base, we read that guy at third base and he starts to get that secondary lead and get, get frisky over third base and then we get that fake step-off pick to third base. The Expos, when I was working for them, they had that play, they used it a lot, they called it the Burke play. What was the guy's a right-handed reliever? Burke. This was 89. Tim, was it? Oh. Anyway, they had that. All right. Um, let, me go, uh, let me go down the column here. 
and we'll go to some PFP stuff, just some thoughts on PFP. Uh, comebackers. I'm talking a ball at you or to your left that's hit fairly firm. We like our pitchers to take that ball, run to first base, and dart the ball to the first baseman with a low elbow. I want a flat trajectory. I don't want it back in here where they create downhill plane to that first baseman where they're like, you're right on top of them. I want to, because what I've found is a lot of times with those pitchers, that are used to long arm and boom and, and having some rhythm to their pitches when they get that comebacker and they have to wait for that first baseman. They get that iron elbow and they kind of choke it off and we get balls thrown away. Never have had a ball thrown away on that run and dart. Now if the ball's hit to my right, you know, that's a little different. We like to see them take a little shuffle step, keep their hands together and throw the ball out of their shirt pocket because they have to be an infielder. So it's a little shorter arm action it's a little lower arm action. It's a little quicker action. Uh, and we work on that on a daily basis. Uh, comebackers to second, shortstop covering. And we really make a distinction between shortstop and second baseman because as a, as a shortstop, you can lead that guy to the base and we'll turn and double play. But if you lead the second baseman to the base, you're leading him into left center field and you won't turn a double play. So we work a lot on comebackers and what I'd like to do on a comebacker, I want to catch the ball one-handed. I don't want to catch the ball. I don't want this hand in there because guys get screwed up. They get The ball's coming this way and they get their hand away. They can have their hand down here, but for me it works best if it's one-handed and if they have enough time, we'd like to step, catch, and throw as opposed to catch the ball square, turn, and try and gain some momentum. I want to have momentum in, in a step, catch, throw mode. Throw the ball out of your shirt pocket. Elevate that throw to the shortstop. Uh, where you run into trouble, you got the shortstop covering and the ball's hit to your right. And now a lot of times, what happens? The shortstop's going for the ball, and now you have to wait for the second baseman. So you need to practice that also. Shortstop's covering, but no, it's hit to your right. So now I end up waiting for the second baseman to get to the base. All right? Second baseman, we've already talked about what we want to do there. Comebackers to home, you got to work on it. Now, I've seen a lot of times guys get that elbow down and dart that ball and, and, and uh, they throw a 10 foot chain link ball, you need to work on it. Okay, just like you need to work on pitch outs and intentional walks. I thought it was very interesting, I don't know if you, in the World Series, uh, I want to say it was, was it Ray King, the left hander? Uh, they're going to walk somebody, I don't know who it was, time out. Brings, uh, brings Dave Duncan out there, and they walk him, but the catcher doesn't stand up. Matheny gets behind the plate, and he gets about four feet, four feet out. Now, in intentional walk, you got to have both feet in the catcher's box, but he gets four feet outside. I thought this was a pretty good thing. He gets a, maybe four feet is an exaggeration. I don't, I don't know if anybody else noticed this, but I definitely noticed this. He got four, he got way outside. I mean, he was going to walk him definitely. This wasn't a pitch around. This was an intentional walk with the catcher down. Okay, well, what happened? He said, man, I can't, and a lot of guys can't throw intentional, they can't throw into that, that blank space. And so instead of throwing in the blank space, they just move the, because you can move the catcher outside the catcher's box or just one foot in the catcher's box and get him way off the plate. So in, he was down in a down catching stance instead of being up in an up catching stance. To me, I, I think that might be a pretty good intentional walk technique. Uh, because everybody here has seen some, some uh, sports center where you get this blooper where this guy's trying to throw an intentional walk and all of a sudden, you know, the, the bolts start jumping out of his elbow and he throws one over the catcher's head and because uh, he can't throw an intentional walk. Well. When did he practice it? Probably never. Not in spring training, probably never. And one of the things we do, that's how we finish our bullpens up with pitch outs, modified pitch outs, and intentional walks. But I thought that was a unique way of handling the situation. And probably one that is probably pretty good strategy for majority of uh, players. Uh, squeeze flips to home plate. One of the things we do when we have a squeeze bunt defense on, uh, we're driving the guy at third base and that pitcher's coming straight off the mound when the ball's bunted. Uh, if it's bunted to his glove side, we have him drop his glove so that he can flip with his 
glove hand as opposed to trying to get around it and do that or you know catch it and flip it which you're not going to get the guy out if it's way to his right or his left we're going to first base but we like that underhand flip with either hand and and we and then they, well what happens if there's a rundown at home plate well let's get him out on one throw uh, short ball third base line uh, I anytime the ball's hit softly to the third base line I tell our pitchers just assume he's a good runner okay so when we go to the third base line there it's load and throw no crow hop assume he's a good if he's not a good runner you know you can take a little bit off but assume he's a good runner as opposed to getting there and then all of a sudden uh oh I'm in trouble now I'm not in a position to throw so anything soft to the third base line we throw with no step and, and uh, these are obviously we're back into the buffet mode and uh, you may feel differently and if it works anything that works for you is good short ball to the first base line uh, uh, you know, I've kind of gone back and forth on this, but we've gone to, we call for that ball. I got it, I got it. And the other thing, anytime you're calling for the ball, especially going to the first baseline, I like to have our pitchers put their glove up in the air. Give that first baseman movement so that we don't end up with the first baseman going for the ball and the second baseman coming up to get the ball and then we have a meeting in the Bermuda Triangle and, and everybody's safe. So that, I have that pitcher call for the ball, especially if it's hit down the first base line. Especially if it's hit down the first base line. Uh, uh, Bun defenses, you know, not, no reason to talk about that other than with a runner on uh, first and second base. Uh, I, I think you need a sure out bunt defense and for me uh, a sure out bunt defense means that you have to have the third base line covered in that no man's land where the third baseman can't get up and get it because he can't leave early because of the runner on first and second and where it's too far away for the catcher to get it so for me that sure bunt defense means that that pitcher's got to break to the cut of the circle around home plate so he delivers that pitch and he breaks there one thing that that we try and do in a bunt situation it's a one look okay short lead going back or whatever our key is and we want to throw a low strike in a bunt situation because and I'll tell you why number one for me that low strike is a lot tougher to bunt for many guys because they have to make an adjustment and go down and get it and they drop the barrel but if they're not bunting and I throw that ball down, I got a chance to get a ground ball for a double play. I throw that ball up and they're not bunting and there's a strong possibility they whack that ball in the gap. The other thing is I start working up from strike from an 0-0 count. Now I throw the ball up and he doesn't bunt it. Now it's ball one, next ball two. And I, I think a lot of times we get into situations where we walk the bases loaded because we're trying to, trying to have him pop the ball up. Well, most times they don't need help. They'll pop it up on their own. And, uh, 30? Okay, they'll pop it up on their own. And uh, I'd rather have that ball down. And I want them to munt that ball, especially with a runner on first. For me, you know, they sacrifice with a runner on first base. Yeah, that's one of the few plays in professional baseball. If you get an out at first base, both the offense and the defense is happy. You know, if you really look at things, they, they bun a runner from first to second the next two guys have got to hit 500 to score that guy so I want to make sure in a bunting situation that they bunt the ball so that low mid strike is important breaking to the cut is important the next thing is if I'm going to break on a 90 which most of us have some type of defense where that guy gets off the mound he breaks hard to that 90 and you know down stay down and follow your glove Brent and I were talking about directing that play and uh, probably for 25 years uh, I let the pitch I didn't have the catchers make a call and I think that's the best way we just do it a little bit differently now because that's what what uh, our staff wants to do but I think the pitcher has the best idea of where the ball should go based on running speed of the guy at second and the force of the bunt how hard the ball is bunted so I think the pitcher can make that call on his own quite frankly the only time he can't make a call if the ball's bunted up in the air and, and our rule is you catch it unless the catcher says drop and if the catcher says drop you gotta let that ball drop you can't let it touch your glove or your body otherwise that's an intentional drop and the ball's dead and all the runners have to go back 
batters out. You let the ball drop. Now maybe we get a double play, especially with runners on first and second, because there's no infield fly. There's no infield fly on a bunted ball. Okay, so breaking hard to that third base line, and uh, you know we'd like to go to third base, but if we can't, we're in a position uh, to either go to third or, or to, to first base. Uh, one thing about a ball bunted back at you with a runner on second. I want my pitchers to always think about going to second base as opposed to, unless it's extremely, unless we've got like a two runner or three run lead or the ball's bunted extremely softly or they got a, a blue chip runner on first base, we want to be in a position to throw to second base. If you watch Greg Maddox, and we had talked about this before, he most always, he's really quick and he'll go to second base maybe with a marginal chance of getting the guy, but knowing that I'm quick enough to go to second, we go back to first, we still got a chance to get that guy out. We still have a chance to get that guy out. Now, if you've got a guy like that and the situation is right, well, certainly uh, that's something that you want to be cognizant of that is a possibility for, for your pitchers. Uh, uh, scramble drill. This is a good one. For me, how many times have you had balls hit back at your pitcher and he, he doesn't know what to do? It's hit off him, he can't find the ball. Well, we'll do this every, every day at the end of our PFPs. I'll just take hard balls or incredible balls. The guy throws the pitch, I'll stand behind him or I'll stand off to the side of him. I'll bounce the ball off his chest or I'll roll it some way. And he's got to find that ball, gain balance, and throw the ball to first base. Now, ideally, you'd like that third baseman to really close on that pitching mound on any comebacker. But those pitchers have to feel a lot of those balls, so we do that scramble drill quite frequently so that that pitcher can find that ball and be under control. Under control is a, is a key factor here. How many, they, they rush and all of a sudden that ball is down the right field line and we've got problems. But finding that ball and being under control, uh, that's something that, uh, that, that's a good little drill. Another one, uh, covering first base on tweeners. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time on this, and and this is one that we don't call. If the ball is a tweener, and if I can get the 